deep down, we all long to be accepted. We long to be loved. We long to be noticed. And perhaps in our world, in our society, in our culture, the, 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 the troubling things that we see, maybe at the root of a lot of those things is this sense of people not feeling loved, of people not feeling noticed. I'm always amazed in the gospel accounts as we read about Jesus, how often he went out of his way to speak truth and hope and encouragement to other people, how often he lingered in order to heal people, how often he noticed and accepted and loved others. As many of you know, we have a sister uh, partnership, a sister church in Lalongwe, Malawi. It's called Lingadzi CCAP. And the friendships that have been fostered with that congregation have been wonderful. We had a Zoom call a couple of weeks ago, and we're just catching up and talking about how hopefully they can come and visit us later this fall and uh, hopefully next summer. Uh, we will be able to go and, and join them. And, and it's always so good to be in that community. And as I was working on this sermon today and, and thinking about this idea, not working on it today, working on it this week and thinking about this idea of adoption and being accepted, I was reminded of something that happened to me a couple of years ago when I was in Malawi. Uh, my good friend Abusa Biswick, uh, Pastor Biswick, uh, stopped by where we were staying and, and he and I were going to go to lunch and, um, and then he was going to go and take me and show me his new church, his new congregation. And so as we're driving to lunch, he says, oh, and by the way, we're also going to go to the wedding reception of some people in my new church. And I had thought to myself, and as I looked at what I was wearing, I said, um, I don't think that's a good idea. I said, I'm wearing khakis and a polo shirt. And I know how people in Malawi dress for weddings and for big events, the pastors still are very formal. So even me showing up in khakis and a polo shirt is, is very underdressed in Malawi. And I said, I don't think I'm really dressed how I should be dressed to go to this wedding reception. He says, ah, it'll be fine. So we go to this wedding reception and in African culture, Biswick grabs my hand and, and we walk together into this wedding reception. It's an outdoor reception, at least three or 400 people there. And he grabs my hand and we walk up right to the very front of the wedding reception where literally the only thing, only people in front of us are the bride and groom and their family. We are in the front row with all the abuses, with all the pastors. And Biswick says, just take a seat here. And as I am sitting there, these other pastors come up and start talking to me and introducing themselves to me. The family comes over, says hello and greets me. Other people are introduced to me. And I'm sitting here thinking, this is the strangest thing. And then as I'm sitting there, they bring a meal, they bring a soda, they bring a piece of wedding cake. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, this bride and groom have to be wondering who's the white guy sitting at the very front of our wedding reception whom we have no idea who he is. And so actually later I said to one of the pastors, I said, you know, it, it would be strange for that sort of thing to happen in the United States. And this pastor said to me, he said, oh, but it's so different in Malawi. This couple would have been so honored that you gave up time from your busy day to come and join them for their wedding reception. They would have been rejoicing and knowing that you were there enjoying the festivities. They warmly would have welcomed you in to this gathering. And I thought to myself, wow, what a gift of hospitality. What a gift of welcoming. How, how I felt. I mean, I was underdressed. I was not, was not representing things well because I didn't have my collar on or anything like that. And yet I was so welcomed and felt such great warmth from everybody around me. I was brought in. And what we want to talk about today is this idea of, of how God brings us in to God's family. How, in a sense, we are adopted, adopted by God. The Apostle Paul that we're going to read in just a second, he's the only one who uses this language of adoption in the, in the, in the letters of the New Testament. 
But he wants to describe this great gift that is given to us for those who choose to follow Jesus. That we are adopted into God's family. That we are welcomed and we are loved and we are cherished. And so we're continuing on in our look at Romans chapter 8. We are doing this for six weeks. This is the second week of this sermon series. We're going to be reading verses 12 through 17. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Now we're going to be talking more about the Holy Spirit in upcoming weeks. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we might also share in his glory. The Apostle Paul says, we are adopted. And and I want to look at verse 15, because it's important. It's, It's a technical understanding of adoption. Paul says, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive, and this is with the key here, Brought about your adoption to sonship. Brought about your adoption to sonship. So we need to understand culturally what the Apostle Paul is saying here. Because some would say, well, that doesn't sound very inclusive that we're adopted into sonship. But we have to understand culture and context. In the days of the Apostle Paul, if a man was living and he had no son... He would oftentimes adopt a son in order to transfer his wealth, his things he'd accumulated to someone else. That was the way in which things worked. So the Apostle Paul says we are adopted to this kind of sonship. We know Paul didn't believe in, Paul's ultimate issue was that we find our identity in Christ. He said there's neither Jew nor Greek, free nor slave, male nor female. We are all in Christ. But in this context, the Apostle Paul is saying, I want you to think about what happens when someone becomes someone's son, when they are adopted. There were four things that would happen. First of all, if that father adopted a son, adopted a man and became his son, all debts of that son were paid. The second thing that would happen in that is that the son would take on a new name and a new identity and they would become an heir, H-E-I-R, heir of the father. The third thing that would happen is that the father was now liable for anything that the adopted son did. And the fourth thing is that the adopted son now had a responsibility to carry out the will of the father. So an adoption, it wasn't just adopting. It was There were several things that were going on with that. Things around responsibility, things around liability, things around the name change, things around debts being canceled. And so the Apostle Paul says, I want you to think about this adoption to sonship when you consider who you are in Jesus Christ. Because this is what happens to us. We are adopted in to God's family. We get a new name. We get a new identity. Christ takes on our liability. Christ takes on our debts and our sins. And we receive this great and incredible gift. It is a status that is given to us of which we did nothing to deserve. We carry on the name. And what the Apostle Paul wants us to see and to understand is that until that moment happens, until we walk into and receive the grace of Jesus Christ, 
We are as orphans. We don't have a place. But when we receive God's love, we receive this new identity. We become heirs. We become co-heirs with Christ, as the Apostle Paul says. And this is a great and incredible gift. This gift of grace that is given to us. This new creation that we become. Because we become like the firstborn son. And in that day, in that culture, the firstborn son was the heir. Everything passed through him. He received a larger portion of the inheritance. He carried the family name. And the Apostle Paul says, in God's economy, every one of us, male or female, Jew or Greek, slave or free, we all get the rights of the firstborn son. Because God's economy is so different than the economy of this world. So what I want to do for the rest of this sermon is I want to talk about two attributes of this adoption. What comes with this adoption? And I want to suggest that this adoption is both privilege and responsibility. It's a privilege. We're adopted in. We get a seat at the table. But it also comes with this sense of responsibility that that we are to deny ourselves, that we are to live fully for Jesus Christ. As the the Apostle Paul says in Galatians, I have been crucified. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And so first of all, adoption as a privilege. Adoption that says you get a seat at the table. So I want to read a story from 2 Samuel chapter 9. It's the story of David and Mephibosheth. And some of you may recall that that David grew up with Jonathan, who was the son of Saul. And David and Jonathan had a a really tight friendship that so much so they covenanted together to, to care for each other and to honor one another. And then Saul and Jonathan are both killed in battle. And David laments. And he grieves over the loss of his best friend. And then in 2 Samuel chapter 9, we read this. David asked, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household, because remember Saul's household had all pretty much been wiped out at this point, named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David, and the king said to him, Are you Ziba? At your service, he replied. The king said, Is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness, show God's mercy? Ziba answered the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is lame in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is the house of Machir, the son of Amiel and Lodavar. So King David had him brought from Lodavar, from the house of Machir, the son of Amiel. When Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he said. Don't be afraid, David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. I love this story because to me, it speaks about what the mercy of God is all about, what it is that God is seeking to do in our lives. Because what does God's mercy do? God's mercy goes out looking for others. Jesus went out looking for the lost, looking for the oppressed, looking for those who felt as they did not have a place. And David says, I want to find and show mercy to whomever is left from the household of Jonathan. And they discover this child named Mephibosheth, although he is now an adult, who had been dropped by his nurse when he was younger. And because of that, his feet were crippled. And he had no place. He actually had no name. It's fascinating when you look at this as the story unfolds. And as Ziba, the servant of Saul, speaks to David, he doesn't even call Mephibosheth by name. He just says there is a son. 
who is lame in both feet, a son who is crippled. There is no naming of this son because he appears, at least as you read through the story, to be an embarrassment. He doesn't fit in. He's different. And David says, go and bring him to me. And then as he is brought into the presence of David, David calls him by name. As I read that, I think about, you know, Jesus when he sees Mary at the garden and she doesn't recognize him. And then he calls her by name and everything changes. And from Mephibosheth, the same is true. Jesus, or David calls him, get excited here, folks. David calls him by name and says, I want you to be with me. And look at verse seven. What a gift. Listen to what is said. Fear not, David said, don't be afraid, for I will surely show you kindness, mercy, for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. And can you imagine Mephibosheth? He was probably fearing for his life because everyone from the family of Saul had been wiped out in battle. And David says, come close. I want to show you mercy. I want to restore you. I want you always to sit at my table. And the great thing for David, you have to imagine this, every time he would come back to his house and he would sit at the table and he would eat a meal at night, he would see Mephibosheth, a visible reminder of what mercy and restoration are all about. And do you know what happens to us when we're adopted? When God says, welcome to the family, he says, I've got a place at the table for you. I have sought you out with my mercy. I want to restore your life. You have nothing to fear. Because when the spirit of God lives in us, folks, we have nothing to fear. And what a great gift that is. God keeps his promise. God shows us his mercy. God restores us. But there's more to the story because with adoption, I think also comes a sense of responsibility. Also comes this sense of saying that because of what Jesus has done for us, there are things that we need to be about. There are things that, that, that it, it's more than just God's glory. We see this in verse 17, and we don't necessarily always like this. The Apostle Paul says, now look, if we are children, then we are heirs. So we've talked about this. We've been adopted in. Heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we, how do we become co-heirs? This is what's interesting. He connects this idea of being heirs and says, if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. See, this is the part that we don't like. This is the responsibility piece that comes with adoption that says we have to, we have to figure out how do we serve our living God? Because there is going to be suffering. Now, the early church understood this way better than we do. We, we look around, and, and we, living here in the States, we are so blessed. There is not persecution. There is not this sense that we may lose our lives because of our faith. But in the days when the Apostle Paul is writing, everything is different. There are people out to kill Christians. There are people who live in, that we know, you know, in our own context, and not people who live in the States, but people throughout this world who are persecuted, who literally risk their lives for the sake of Jesus Christ. And I don't think most of us probably live our lives like that, but they are willing to do whatever it takes. And the Apostle Paul, a few chapters earlier in Romans chapter 6, writes about this. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? And then he brings up baptism language. Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. The Apostle Paul says, I want you to think about baptism. And what would happen in those early church days 
new believers would walk down to the river, or they'd walk down to the lake or the pond or whatever it was, and they would take off their old clothes and they would step into those waters and they would be baptized, fully immersed with the priest, the pastor, whoever it is, saying, you are buried with Christ. And then they would be brought up out of those waters with the words, you are raised to new life. You get buried to the old things. You die to the old ways. You get raised to the new life in Jesus Christ. And then you walk out of those waters and you put on the white clothes of righteousness and you're wrapped in a new way and you become this new creation. You are fully restored. This is the gift of baptism. And those early believers understood something. They were a new creation. They were dying to everything of this world. Things of this world meant nothing to them any longer. Because now all they lived for was Jesus Christ. And that changed their effect. It changed their understanding of things. Because basically they're saying... You to the Roman government, to those who are persecuting the church, you can take nothing away from me because I already have everything that I need in Jesus Christ. You see, when we receive an inheritance, even think about that financially, when we receive an inheritance, it can literally change everything. We have new security. And the Apostle Paul says, look, when your inheritance is Jesus Christ, everything changes. You walk in a new freedom because now you live fully and faithfully for Jesus. And so this gift of adoption is a gift. It comes as an inheritance God reaches out and says, I want you to be an heir, to be a co-heir with Jesus. So perhaps today, you need to be reminded that you have a seat at the table. That Jesus comes alongside you and grabs your hand and walks you down the center aisle to this great and wonderful and awesome reception. And he sits you in the front row. And God says, welcome to my table. Maybe that's what you need to hear. And so if that is the case for you, I want you to hear that. That you are loved. But for some of us, we need to hear the second message of adoption. Which is that it also comes with responsibility. Because some of us, we've been sitting at the table too long. God's been nudging us, pushing us, challenging us to get out and to start living out our faith. And we have become risk adverse. We like it at the table. And so if that's the case for you, I want you to consider, where is it that God's nudging me? Have I gotten comfortable? Have I really died to the things of this world? And am I really living fully for Jesus? Let's not play it safe. So whether you're looking for a place to belong, whether you're feeling like you've gotten a little too comfortable, either way, or whether you're in between all of those, remember this. You've been adopted into the family of God because of what Christ has done. You have this great inheritance. You are heirs, co-heirs with Jesus. And that, my friends, is great and wonderful news. So let us receive that and walk and live in humility, seeking out ways to receive the grace of Jesus Christ and also to share that grace of Jesus Christ. Pray with me, please. God, for this day, we thank you. We thank you that uh, that we're not alone. Thank you that we are accepted and we are loved. 
Lord, sometimes we live so much for ourselves and not for the sake of others, and, and we confess that, and we're sorry for that. Lord, sometimes we get too comfortable at the table, and, and, and we don't move out in faith, and we apologize for that. Lord, some of us need to just accept your love, to see that you have come for us. So God, help us to be faithful in the journey you have in front of us. Guide us and lead us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.